Lucas Marte was sent to jail as the ringleader of a multi-million dollar cocaine operation. He was also grossly overweight and warned by his physician that his current lifestyle, if left unchecked, would, would likely kill him. Faced with this grim prognosis, Koss started to get in shape using the tools he had, his prison cell and his own body weight. Within six months, he lost 70 pounds and replicated his successful formula of body weight exercises with 20 other inmates. Then he launched Conbody, a prison style boot camp that has gained over 20,000 clients and hires formerly incarcerated individuals to teach fitness classes. Since the launch of his company, he's been featured in over 200 major media outlets such as NBC, CNN, The New York Times, TED Talks, and Men's Fitness. He also won major pitch competitions such as The Five Ventures, Pitch for Good by Tom's Shoes, and the YPO Shark Tank competition, which raised a combined $200,000. So we'll get started. So I, I, I read your book <laughs> and I have to be honest with you, I've, I've read my fair share of uh, diet and exercise books and I just have to say it was really refreshing to read something um, where you kept it real from beginning to end. So it was, it. Great. Um, and I remember being 23 and having that attitude that you mentioned in the book, like I know everything, you can't say anything to me um, because yeah. I was that way at one point. But um, what did it feel like to have that physician tell you, um, and I think you were at Rikers for about a year in when mm -hmm. you got that um, news from the doctor, what did it feel like at the age of 23 um, to know that if you didn't change, you would be dead inside of five years? It was, it was a shock. I didn't, I didn't believe I was going to, I was in that state of mind or and my body was like twisted like that. Cause I didn't feel you know, I've seen people that weigh like 500 pounds, but I didn't, I, I wasn't 500 pounds. I was, you know, 230 pounds, um, 231 pounds. And I, I, I felt slower. I it was, uh, I didn't feel like how I was when I was a kid, but I didn't feel like I was going to die. You know, and when they told me that, I was like, are you sure? Like, I was just like skeptical, you know, like, I'm not going to die. Are you crazy? And then they told me like, my cholesterol levels were so high that I could have probably died of a heart attack. So it really, it really shook me up in a sense of like, damn, I need to, I need to get back into shape. And, and now is the perfect time because I have the time to really concentrate on myself. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what I like went right back to my prison cell, started like doing dips, jumping jacks for like five minutes and then said, fuck this shit. <laughs> and, and like, uh, it was not until the next morning when I like really started reflecting and thinking and then I'm like, damn, I need to really start getting my act together. And I started running. Uh, I just started like running laps. Catapulted you into that change, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. What immediately captured my attention about the tears and the exercises is that, um, and, and knowing what setting you were in it, it dawned on me like you don't really need any fancy gym equipment uh you don't need any fancy membership uh for that matter uh so what would you say to someone considering con body but can't quite get through tier one yet or perhaps because you know i don't i'm not a runner per se but i do do a little bit of running but perhaps has never even tried running so someone who can't get through the first tier or has never run what words um what advice would you offer them i, I would tell them just to keep like a real short-term goal you know concentrate on working out for seven days like do that week workout and then once you accomplish that you know set another two week go and then from there 30 after you, after you do 30 days you just feel like in that habit where you miss a day, you feel like messed up and like, I don't know, regretful for not working out, you know, and it takes about like 30 days to rebuild a habit. Okay. So if I'm hearing you right, just start with that short term goal and keep building on that. Exactly. exactly. And then make, it, make yourself feel guilty for not doing it <laughs> if you haven't missed a day. Absolutely. So I immediately connected with a part of your book where you share about your parents migrating here from the DR. And, you know, I grew up with, you know, a lot of um, Latino kids from different, you know, Latin American country from the Caribbean as well. And, and many of my childhood friends had similar experiences, really struggling in poverty. <clears throat> 
What do you say to the young kids today who struggle in that poverty? What reality can you share with them about that fast pace and that flashy excitement that comes with the lifestyle of dealing drugs? There's, uh, I, I, sh I go out to like juvenile detention centers. I speak to these high school students that are like really in that cusp of like ending up in the system and, and their, their minds is all about money, you know? So I really, some, you know, I'm doing it in a different way. I'm making money in a different way. I have this, I have that, you know? So they really want to, they have that instant, instant gratification mindset, but you know, there are other ways, you know, if you trust this process, it will work out no matter what you're going to be okay. Like you're going to have a place to live. You're going to eat some food, you know, you're going to be dressing up any way you want. You don't want to like risk your life and then end up in this position where you you're being told what to wear. You're being told when to take a shit. You're being told, you know, what to fucking eat. And it's the worst food you could ever eat. You know, I'd rather be broke and go to my mom's crib and like eat the best Dominican food I could ever get in my life. So I'm going to get um, to <laughs> Yeah. It's yeah. funny that you should mention the food because like that's where I was going next. Um, yeah. You break down in the book and I, I kind of, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I put a little sticky uh, marker next to the pages because I, I had to go back to that and look at that food regimen because I'm yeah. really conscious about what I eat today. My one simple question about that is, have you adjusted that type of a dietary, if you will, regimen outside now, you know, being out of prison, what have you done to adjust that, you know, that diet, if you will? Well, I, I tell people use an alternative. Uh, like this is what we, we basically like, instead of eating, you know, a can of sardines like we had in prison, like, you know, get a, get some fresh salmon, you know, from the fish market, you know? So, uh, I, I really, I'm not a dietitian, so I don't like, I don't recommend this diet for everyone. And I, I believe you should really go to a nutritionist and get yourself checked out instead of like, you know, following what I wrote. Cause this is what worked for me. Okay. So it's, it's not going to work for everybody, but it's basic. What I basically did is just like really lowered my carb intake, stop drinking all the processed juice and Wait. shit. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that, that's the sperm killer. Uh, <laughs> that's what they call it inside. And, um, and and just re in high intake in protein, best fruits and vegetables, and and that's basically what I did. Oh, so I have to ask you. I assume that you're not eating prison burritos anymore, but yeah. I, I want to ask kind of a, a real question about food. And um, you know, how do you stay away from things like mofongo and just our culturally rich foods, um, which you know you know we share in common, but don't necessarily support a healthier lifestyle. So what's your take on that? I don't stay away from it. I, I, I love it. I love it. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I love the food. I just don't overindulge like I was before. You know, like, uh, it, it usually when you go to like a, uh, Spanish setting, most like you go to these Spanish restaurants, they serve you like four, five scoops of big ass rice. Like they really fill up your whole plate. And I, what I tell them is like, yo, cut that shit in half. Like, take out you know give me one scoop of rice and like i'll take all the other stuff that's i, I really limit myself from overindulging um I, I love monfongo i like i don't i don't eat it every day uh but i i do i do indulge like once in a while i'll have a piece of cake dominican cake or whatever you know good stuff um yeah i mean don't don't limit yourself but just don't kill yourself you know makes sense moderation yeah. Talk, um, you talk about the inspiration, um, specifically Little C, your son, and uh, the guys on the inside that you helped out um, create this lifestyle for them as well, um, to keeping you going down the path of health and wellness while you were inside. And, you know, from a personal perspective, I can certainly relate to the motivation of our children, um, you know, giving us or, or wanting us to be the best version of ourselves. But what I want to ask about is what does it feel like to have so many men on the inside and now on the outside look up to you for guidance, both on health and wellness? Um, and, and how does it feel to help at the time what was over a thousand, um, uh, all these men to lose over a thousand pounds? Tell me about that experience. It was, 
it was an experience that I just thought it was a camaraderie builder. I didn't really think that I was like, I didn't, I knew I was like helping these guys and it was just like, a, a, like some type of teamwork. And it, we had the time to like, we just work on our bodies, support each other. It was, it was a team. I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think I was going to come out with a business after, you know, helping these guys to wait, lose weight. But, um, it was, it was, just like something we did in prison, you know, like let's get together, work out, you know, most of the guys in there are like motivated by females, you know, they come out they're like, oh, I got to get big for the girls, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and, and that's what uh, uh, most of the guys' mindsets were too. Um, can't blame them. You know, I, I was working out with guys who done 20, 30 years. Um, but also like for our family, you know, like my son, was uh, almost everything to me in there you know he he really motivated i don't know you feel that that pain in your heart when you're separated from your child and every time i saw him and every time i saw him walk away it was it was even harder but also motivating to get out there and like really be a dad you know and i feel like a, a dad is a dad a day a day after day you know like that's a dad you know being there no matter what so and I couldn't be a dad while I was in there. Okay. So how would you respond to someone who says con body is just for men? Uh, they're completely wrong. Um, my, my mom is 63. She works out four times a week nice. with us. She's a beast. <laughs> uh, and, and primarily the people that come to our, our classes are we have 70% women. Nice. Uh, which is, which when the women come in there and you see guys in there, they kick their asses and the guys be like dying. Uh, Cause most of the guys that come, you know, people that come to our studio are not used to like working out with no equipment, cardio, calisthenics. Guys usually go to the gym and they lift a million pounds and then they just take a break and then, you know, lift again. Um, this is nonstop. Like this is, you know, you know, work out till you die, basically. Now I'm, I'm not killing anybody. I'm not a killer, but don't push me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's just like pushing yourself to, to the next level. And that's how we worked out in prison. It's like we, we supported each other to like, we take it to the next level. We were doing like 1200 pushups a day, you know, and out here people say 1200, like that's impossible, but that's what we were doing, you know. And when seventy percent of your your classes are being filled by by women, then obviously um, you're reaching across both sets of spectrums. So that's great. Definitely. One of the things that I really appreciated was how you framed addiction in the book. Um, and and a lot of times the most obvious addict form of addiction um, is the drugs and the alcohol. And um, but there are, as you mentioned, many other forms of addictions either to substances and or behaviors um, that can destroy us and our lives. So do you recommend or do you have any recommendation for clients that they seek outside help for these issues? And do you have any personal preferences in terms of recovery programs? Uh, definitely. I mean, it, I feel like everybody needs therapy. And, and the problem is when you come out of prison, uh, a lot of guys have this like machismo like attitude that I don't need help, I could do this. And I feel like that's what, that's what, that's how I changed, you know, but I need help. And, and what I refer people to a lot of nonprofit organizations that help, uh, especially for people that's coming out of prison. I work with Fortune Society, Defy Ventures, Thrive, um, uh, Career Gear. So all these nonprofits that helped me along the way when I was released uh, to readapt, and, you know, they, they really helped me with my, not only my psyche, but like just my whole living situation. That's great. Good to know. So one of my favorite parts of the book was when you were in solitary and not because you were in solitary, obviously, but because yeah. um, when, when the stamp fell out of the Bible yeah. and um, the question that I have about that, and there are a few questions I have about that, that period of time and that experience. But the first one is um, when the, you, in the book, you said that you got chills. Did you equate that stamp falling out of the Bible as almost like a, a spiritual awakening or something similar? 
Yeah, definitely. I, I felt, I, I call it a spiritual awakening. Um, I mean, yeah. I didn't, I don't know. I just, I, I felt like I felt something that I never felt before. And there was just weird things that happened to me in that prison cell that it's really unexplainable. And I don't know, some people just don't believe me, but um, it's real. It's what happened to me. And I, I don't know how that stamp was there. Maybe it was there or whatever, but you know, even if somebody put it there and it was there for a while, um, I just felt it was like a sign of hope, Absolutely. Uh, a sign, a sign of like really escaping, you know, you know, a sign of hope to just even communicate with somebody, you know, like there's this che the cheapest probably item that you could buy today is a stamp, you know, and how yeah. I was all about money and a stamp changed my life. Yeah. So. So staying with that, um, staying with that moment for a minute, I know that prior to, prior to that in the book, um, you were still thinking about how not to get caught when you got back out. And I want to know that, I want to ask if it was that moment that shifted that perception for you. Um, and talk to me about the moments after that shift and so going from um a thought a frame of thought where uh, i you know when i get out i'm going to do things where i don't get caught to the shift in you know not wanting to go back to that way of life uh i mean it was it was like right before i ended up in solitary confinement i mean i didn't uh, like my notion was not to go back and like sell drugs uh, uh right before then um i pretty had a i had a pretty good mindset but i I felt like if I would never went through that that um, that situation, I could have ended up in you know falling back into those footsteps. Um, but the mindset was, you know, there was I felt regret. I felt so bad. I I never felt bad for what I've done. And and after like reading the Bible from front to back, I started realizing what I was doing was extremely wrong, and I was affecting thousands of people and was creating this whole web of destruction. And I, I felt like, I don't know, I, I, it really like hurt deep inside my soul. And I felt like I needed to give back in some sort of way. And that's, and that's how like Combody was born. And, and it's, it's funny because we're having this conversation and that's exactly where I was going to next um, in terms of coming to the realization that you were causing that harm and, and coming in touch with, with those feelings. Um, having left prison and, and written calm body and creating calm body helping so many others regain health and wellness in their life literally going from one spectrum to the other because you you know you were hustling and then you went from hustling to end up you know like giving people this gift of health and wellness that has to feel great um what about being of service to others has touched you the most I, I feel like what, what touches me the most, it's, it's a lot of things. I mean, even like when I get my trainers or any employee that's been in the system and they're working for us and they, and I get like a simple text where it says, yeah, I, I thank you so much. Like, and, and just, it's just hearing the emotional and, and like appreciative uh, person on the other end. Uh, it makes me feel like, I don't know like Jesus for a second, you know? Um, good. Yeah, man, you're helping, yeah. you're making a difference in other people's lives. And I, I've had, I had one incident where this woman, she came in um, when I was first starting, I was actually renting out like studios and stuff. And, and uh, yeah. she came she, and after she kept working out with us for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one day I was, I was working right in the front desk and I, I was, her name was Jamie. And I was like, Jamie, you, you lost a lot of freaking weight. And she turned around and started crying. And it was like, it was because of you, you know, like, I have no excuse. You did this in like the worst conditions you could ever do it in. I have everything I could possibly have here. And your story motivated me. And she lost a hundred pounds with us, a wow. hundred pounds. It is a motive. It is a very motivational story. Um, and thank and thank you for sharing that with me. Um, in the book, you talk about regret, you talk about shame, you mentioned that earlier. And 
in addiction and in recovery, we know that these emotions have the capability of keeping us entangled sometimes with old behaviors um, and belief systems. Essentially, they can keep us stuck sometimes, but that's not your story. You turn that guilt and that regret and it fueled and created combody. What do you say to those who are still struggling or suffering with guilt and regret? Uh, just get rid of the shame. You know, it, it, everything is short. Everything is limited. Um, every, uh, all, all our time here is limited. So why, why waste your time and just like sitting in your sorrows, you know, get your ass, get moving, do the time. Do the um, time. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. Thank you. So in a recent TED talk, um, I don't know how recent it is, how recent it was. I saw it online. Uh, you talked about the difficulty um, finding a job once you were released from prison. And you asked if one could imagine what it would be like I, at the end of that TED talk to be judged for the rest of your life for the, the worst thing I ever did. And, and quite frankly, I've never been to prison and, or jail. And, um, but I have done things uh, that I'm not proud of or you know, I wouldn't want anyone else to know. How, as a society, do we expect people to change if, if we don't afford them that opportunity? And I didn't have that perspective before you know, reading your book. So thank you for that. Tell us, um, because I, I saw the TED Talk, but um, many probably haven't. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about that is, could you tell us a little bit about what it was like trying to find a job after your release? I mean, it was extremely hard. I, I went to probably like every retail store you could think of on Times Square, Herald Square. Uh, I would I would get these like, you know, the old school like way of applying. And it was really tough. It was hard because a, a lot of people would, like go apply online. And I missed that time lapse where like applications were done in person. You know, it was a piece of paper. You fill it out, you give it to the manager and you like keep moving. And it was frustrating because I didn't know how to use the internet. You know, I missed that that time lapse. I went from like a flip phone to a touch screen. You know, I missed Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all this stuff. It was extremely difficult. Eventually I learned it, but going into these like job sites and like filling out these applications, um, I would it said, Have you ever been convicted of a felony? And, and that was like the second line in most applications. And I would have to say yes. And when I would hand that paper in, you would see that manager just looking, you know, and, and you would see, they will be like, oh, I'll call you back. And I'll be like, you know, back in my head is like, no, you fuck, you're not. Like, like you'll see their body language saying like, yeah, whatever, you know, as soon as they see that check mark. Right. Um, and it was, it was, it was frustrating. I could imagine. Talk to me about how you're helping felons in your area return to the work workforce. Um, so we, and maybe not just your area, but in general. Yeah. in, in general, I mean, a, a lot of people hit me up from across the world. I get, and I, I refer them to organizations that can help them in, in their, their city, their town. Cause I'm, I'm pretty uh, well connected with a lot of nonprofits around the, the country now. Um, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Cause a lot of people ask for help and, and a lot of people, you know, write me a letter and say, I'm coming home in a year, coming home in six months, please save me a spot. And I, I can't, you know, um, I don't have enough funding to have a million studios to hire a billion people yet, but I will get there, you know, and uh, that's right. with, with consistency and patience, that's it. So you have this great, inspiring, real book on transformation. You continue to serve others. What's next for Cosmarte? Uh, so we're looking to open up. Uh, what I want to do with my goal is to open up nine studios in, in the next five years. Uh, we also launch, we're launching our 2.0 like online platform where you can virtually work out with your favorite ex-convicts for five hours a month. Uh, so we're doing a video there. And then we have a documentary that we've been filming for a very long with an Academy Award, Award director. Um, yeah, she's been filming me almost four years and following like my whole mission and like straight out of prison, basically. I like connected with one of her friends over the subway, just talking to people. And it, 
and now she's got like 300 hours of footage which is crazy but yeah that's amazing so if someone wanted to visit uh les and and get to your studios how would we get that information so you could just go to combody.com you could search google and uh and just find all our information there just combody c-o-n-b-o-d-y uh, dot com and and hit up us on on instagram is 294 broom street uh, right. and get yourself locked down and then that on my platform too right <laughs> yep it's right on the site <laughs> i read it yeah. it's great thank, thank you. you i'm actually thinking about um thank you trying it myself so thank you for the inspiration and thank you for awesome. continuing to serve others it's been great chatting with you no i really really appreciate it i really appreciate it thank you thank you